Well, good morning, everyone. And if I've done it right, you should be able to see fabulous Fridays on the screen. Is that what you can see, Carrie? Yes, Marcia. Oh, that is such a relief because you always are a little tense. Do you, did you do it right or not? Well, I am delighted to welcome all of you to Fabulous Fridays. This is a wonderful uh, November the 5th, and uh, we've got some really interesting things going on here, and we'll show you to them. Today, we're going to be looking at what's the difference between a revocable living trust and a testamentary trust. When I was doing meetings pre-COVID, this is a question that I would get asked a lot of times, that people would like to know a little bit more about what are the differences between those two. And our series that we have prepared is we've got a team of us. We've got myself, Marcia Getting with MSU Extension, and I'm the Family Economic Specialist. We're part of that land grant uh, institutional uh, mission to take the university to the people. And joining me as the webinar assistant today is the fantabulous Carrie. She is the one that has prepared uh, the marvelous website that you can go to uh, to listen to the recordings. And I would like to welcome 286 of you that uh, have registered for our series. And as you can see, they're scattered throughout Montana with a little bit uh, more on the Western area, which is fine. And then I also want to welcome the out of staters. Uh, it's really neat when, you know, you almost feel like you're famous if you've got some people out of state uh, watching what you're doing. Now, I wanted to reveal that, yes, indeed, there was an individual that uh, received or that guessed uh, pretty close to the right date. This individual guessed 1890. So I have sent the, the cards to that person and hope that he has already received them by now. So that, and you notice I didn't give a name. So this way we're still guaranteeing that you have anonymity in this particular course. Another program that I thought you might be interested in, particularly if you're a farm ranch wife, is a series that several of our extension agents have gone together and wow, they have got a program you wouldn't believe. As a matter of fact, I would like to participate in it if I had the time and maybe I'll get to a few of those sessions anyway, because one of their speakers is Jolene and I've heard her before and she's really, really good. So if you have any interest at all in learning about communication, about farm management uh, techniques, uh, all kinds of stuff. You, sorry about the use of the word stuff, but you know what I mean? There's a lot out there that would be beneficial. What I've given you is the website here and you are just welcome to sign up for that course and they are going to be starting this Monday night. So you wanna make sure that you get your bid in. Now, we'll quickly look at some of the participant engagement tools because we do have people that are new every time we do one of these sessions. And as you uh, can guess by the background, I'm kind of a wildflower nut. And what I do is use wildflowers as reminders for specific things in our Fabulous Fridays that I want you to remember. And I'm never more thrilled that when I can go out someplace and I'm, I'm sure I'll be there again someday where someone says, well, what did Mrs. Albino do? And I go, yay, they remember the wildflower name. Now let's take a quick look at those of you that were here last week. Let's take a look and see what action did you take as a result of last Friday's session? Did you review the separate listing that you already have? Did you write one or at least start one? That's important. And did you share some of the information about the separate listing that you can include with your will or other type of action? And you can type that in the chat panel. So I'll give you a couple of seconds to do that. And you know, I wish if you're not responding, either it means you can't, you don't know how, or you don't care, you just want the information, you don't have to be clicking around, but, uh, if you're not clicking around, it means you may not know how to do the chat room. So uh, keep in mind that when we start Fabulous Fridays, we have looping slides that go through that Carrie has prepared for about 15 minutes before we start. And that would give you some ideas. And I see Carrie has already given us some answers here. So let's see, hold on a sec. 
Okay, we have at least one person that did start their list. That's good because if you're like me, you may have a lot of those emotionally laden items that you want to make sure that you share with someone. And then some people did share the information with other individuals. So I commend you for doing that. That makes you an educator too. So let's take a look at what we're going to do today. Don't forget, you can use the chat room to put in any questions that you have. And at the end, what we're going to have Carrie do is read those out for me so that uh, we can try to answer as many of those as possible. And I'm delighted to say that we have a new guest that's going to be joining us at the end of the program, and that's Emma Jobson. And she is with uh, the 4-H Center for Youth Development, and she's our Agricultural and Natural Resources Specialist. Now, here's my steer's head. Oh, yeah, that's my favorite flower because, yeah, you can see it looks like a steer. And I enjoy using this one at the, the public meetings because I have people guess. And uh, I sometimes have to boo to be able to get them to figure out what it is. And once you tell them, you know, here's the ears, here's the nose, and, yep, yeah, it's a steer's head. So today I'm going to steer you to become aware of some potential uses for a revocable living trust. I'm also, also, goodness, did I just say that? I'm also going to be, have you become aware of the potential uses for a testamentary trust. So there's two different kinds of trusts that we're going to be looking at. And the way that I'll introduce the topic is using a sugar bowl. And my mom used to keep a sugar bowl at the top of the kitchen cabinet. And I'm sure as kids weren't supposed to know that it was there, but I came in one time and I saw her stuffing money in the sugar bowl. And that's kind of what you're doing with the trust because what you're doing is stuffing assets into a legal entity. So a trust is simply a legal entity that holds the title to the property that you decide that you want to put into the trust. And then what you're going to do is leave those items that are in the trust to some beneficiaries. That's the whole purpose of a trust. And there are now so many kinds out there, it's almost impossible to keep track of them. I mean, we've got revocable, irrevocable, special needs, testamentary, A, B, or bypass. We've got charitable remainder trust, Q-tip, Q-dot, Q-perk, and islet. Woo! We don't have enough time to talk about all of those. So I'm going to focus on the two main ones so that you can think about what they stand for. And then if you want to get fancier than that, then you can look at charitable remainder, for example, or even an islet. And an islet is an irrevocable life insurance trust, okay? So let's take a look at the second poll here today. What percent of Americans do you think have established a revocable living trust? This is some research that AARP did to get an idea. Well, you know, we had a lot of scams out there for a long period of time and probably still do, but the idea is what percent do you think have one? I'm sure all of you are answering right, right? Make sure you click, oh, and don't forget, you have to hit that submit button at the bottom of the page. First time I was doing this, I thought it was answering the chats, no, or the polls. No, I wasn't because I wasn't hitting the submit button. So you have to hit the submit button to make sure that it's recorded, okay? Okay, Carrie has shared the results with us here. And let's see, we've got 43% no answer, but that's an improvement from our last question. That's good. We had the most 33% saying 19. Well, guess what? You guys are right on top of it. Yes, indeed. For this age group of 50 to 64, it is 19%. And it goes up as we have uh, increase in age. So 75 plus, we've got 29% of people have a revocable living trust. Now, if you're going to have a revocable living trust, there's got to be a reason. You know, I, I just don't see 
you know, when somebody comes up and says, well, uh, I've been told I need a revocable living trust. And I want to say, why? What have you heard about a revocable living trust that you think one is appropriate for your situation? So just share with me, and this is multiple choice. So you can, if, you, if you've heard all of those things, you just check each one. If you've only heard one or two, uh, if you haven't heard anything, uh, then you would check that one. And then if there's something up there that I haven't listed, please feel free to include that in the chat room, okay? I'm really going to be interested in the responses to this because we had a disbarred attorney from North Dakota that was in Eastern Montana selling revocable living trusts. And he was going from ranch to farm to ranch. And he was giving this thing about, you know, I think you'd be in your neighbors down the road said that you'd be interested in this. And I really should come up to you and talk to you about it. I had a fit. Okay, let's see, Carrie, what responses that we have here. Well, we've got, uh, wow, 35%. You know, you're going to save money by avoiding this or that. You're going to save a state and federal income tax. Oh, my goodness, and we've got some people say that you're going to save on Montana inheritance tax. No, no. Why do I say that? Montana doesn't have an inheritance tax. We have not had an inheritance tax since the year 2001. But there's a lot of us that don't know about that. And how about federal estate taxes? Let's see, we've got 12% that say that. Hey, unless you have more than $11,700,000, at this point in time, you don't even have a federal estate tax. So here's the deal, 99 Point nine percent of Montanans are not in the federal estate tax bracket. So we don't need to establish them for those kinds of reasons. We've got some that are going to say, you know, that uh, oh, we've got 14% that haven't even heard about it. So let's take a closer look and maybe get an idea of where some of these ideas have come from. Marsha? Yeah. You did have someone say that um, it's to keep creditors at bay. I'm sorry? You did have someone say that um, it is to keep creditors at bay. Keep creditors at bay. That would be a good one to add. But uh, let's take a close look at a revocable living trust and we'll examine that a little bit closer. Now, true, there is a lot of flexibility by having a revocable living trust because you've got some privacy. And my challenge to you is it could be irrevocable after the death of the first spouse. And to give you an example of this, I had uh, a woman and what she had done is uh, listen as her husband was going on about why we need this trust. And what he was going to do is disinherit one of the children. Well, this was a very strong man and his wife goes, you know, I'm not gonna cause a hassle right now. What I will do is change the trust after he's gone. And what she discovered is that the trust became irrevocable after he died and she couldn't change it. So we really need to have a clear understanding of what it is that we're signing instead of just thinking, well, I think I know what it means. So know what you're signing. Second thing is you can, just as you can do a will, you can disinherit uh, anybody that you want to. And there are some people that want to separate out their assets into two irrevocable trusts because each of the parties have children from a prior marriage. Then we anticipate maybe some challenges. Maybe you're starting to exhibit some signs of Alzheimer's and you're really getting concerned about that. Well, hey, I've got a, a thing out there, only I've got a financial power of attorney. And a financial power of attorney can kind of do the same thing. It says, if I have some signs of Alzheimer's and my doctor, and maybe two doctors, say that I'm in the early stages, then my uh, power of attorney goes into effect. 
You may also have lack of experience. You know, I'm thinking of my uncle Earl. And that was back in the day where the wives didn't have their names on any property. The wives didn't handle any of the money. I know this is a long time ago, but it did exist. So what was happening is after he died, she didn't have a clue how to handle the, the farm expenses, paying, uh, you know, even writing checks was very difficult for her. So let's get some of the terminology of a trust down. So as I explain things, it'll, it'll maybe make more sense. First of all, you've got to decide on a name that you want to have for your revocable trust. So you can go ahead and use your names like James Simon and Lois Simon. Now they're the grantors of the trust, but they've also named themselves as trustees. In other words, they're the ones that are going to manage the assets that they have put into the name of the Simon Family Trust, okay? Then the trust award, now the law has a new name. I used to call it grantor. Well, now they call it the trustor or the settlor. <clears throat> anyway, that's the person that puts the asset into the name of the trust. And then you're given the trustee control of the trust. So if the people that establish the trust are the trustees, they are the ones that will control it. But maybe we've got uh, an elderly mother and she's really concerned about paying for the grocery bill, et cetera. And she may name her daughter as the trustee of the trust to manage the assets that are in there and pay any necessary bills, for example. So our trustor, and our trustee could be the same individual. And it might be a husband and wife. It could be grandma and grandpa. Now, when you establish a trust, an attorney is going to recommend to you that you name a successor. And this is something we always need to do, even when we're doing beneficiaries. We say, yes, we want it to go to these individuals. But gee, what if those individuals should be killed with you, or maybe they predecease you? always want to name a successor, okay? You could even become uh, incapacitated. Maybe your original trustee resigns. So name a successor. Think about that before you get to the attorney's office to have the trust written. And your successor trustees could really be anyone that you like, but it might be your adult child. Uh, you could have an adult grandchild that maybe has a lot of experience in the, the money world and you feel that they would be good. I've had people name a trusted friend. I mean, they trust their friend more than they would trust some family members. And that's okay. Some family members just may not have the capacity to handle the trust and do all the necessary things that need to be done. Now, some people decide that they want to have a corporate trustee. And that's fine too. You might name a bank, you might name a corporate trustee, like a, a trust company and figure out that, you know, they kind of know what they're doing. You know, that that is something that they do full time. They know how to do the taxes. They know how to do things. And it could be uh, a really good thing to have that individual or that corporate entity as the secondary or successor trustee. Then when you establish the trust, you also want to have beneficiaries, of course, we, and we have to think about that. Um, do we want them to receive income? You know, so here we've got this entity, we've got this money, and we can take some income off of that to go to these beneficiaries. And then we can say, well, okay, we want it for the co uh, college education of our grandchildren. And then once they all graduate, we're going to give the assets evenly, uh, you know, or at some point in time. So it could be age 40, 45, or 65, for example. And of course, one of your beneficiaries could be your favorite nonprofit. And of mine, the Montana 4-H Foundation, our sponsor of today's program, or at least one of them. Now, when you do a trust, in some ways, it's very similar to writing a will because this is where the directions are. This is how you say what you want to have happen with the assets and the income that you have in your trust. 
And I had what I called a dead hand control grandpa. And what was grandpa doing? He had a 90 page trust. Yep. And he said this, the grandchildren had to go, but this one specific grandson, he had to go to a specific college. He had to get, you know, straight A's and he had to major in business. And that's what we call dead hand control because he's wanting to control behavior from the grave. And you've simply got to decide how much of that you want. I've got one lady that, you know, she's trying to control things down five generations from now. We have no idea what's going to be going on at that point in time. And maybe a trust isn't the way to go. She may be talking about a foundation because there is a rule in Montana, what they call the rule against perpetuities. Uh, what's that? Well, that means a trust cannot last longer than 21 years after the death of the last beneficiary. So if you want something to go on forever, then you're going to be looking at a foundation, for example. Now, if you're going to have a revocable living trust, you have got to change the titles of the items that you want to put into the trust, okay? Remember the disbarred attorney that I said came across the border from Eastern or from, uh, yeah, Western North Dakota? He had these papers that he was giving people. And then the people were calling me up and saying, okay, Marsha, uh, we have a revocable living trust. Now, what do we do? Well, they didn't know that they had to change the titles to give the trust control over those assets. So you change it from your name into the name of the trust. And you can put into the trust anything you want to. It can be your land, it can be your home, your checking accounts, certificates of deposit, your stocks, your bonds, your mutual funds, anything that you want in the trust has to be changed to the name of your trust. That's the only way that the trust can have control over those assets, okay? Let me repeat that. The trust document only controls assets that are in the name of the trust. And I get lots and lots of questions about, well, can we do this? Can we do that? And I say, you have to look at the trust document. Does the trust document allow you to use the money to buy a pickup? Does it allow you to buy some property? I mean, eh, there's all these details that are included in trust as a result of people not making it perfectly clear about what's going on. Now, what is this going to cost? You know, it varies. You know, does, I know you hate that answer, but it does. Uh, I have heard anything from $2,000 to $8,000 for a married couple, and it depends on how, um, how much information you want in the trust and how many times you meet with the attorney to get these kinds of things outlined. And then I've also seen 1,500 to 5,000 for a single individual's trust. So it depends. Now I'm really curious of our people that are here today, do you have a revocable living trust? And that's an easy one. It's either yes or no. No third option. I don't know. You either have it or you don't have it. Okay. So we've got six, um, 13 percent that do have one. We've got 44 percent that say the answer is no, they don't. But you're here today to learn more about it, and that's good. I commend you because we always need to know more as we get into the estate planning process. And I kid you not, something that I would have done 20 years ago, I'm not going to do that now. So that's why your plan kind of changes through your life. Things are a lot different for a newly married couple than they are for grandma and grandpa who are now 85 and 87. So let's take a look at what else we can learn. Well, we learn from our sugar bowl. 
You see, that's kind of what a trust is. You're putting things into the sugar bowl, but I'm saying don't get bold over. I don't even think that's probably a word, but don't get bowled over with the revocable living trust until you learn more about them, okay? And you need more than just Marcia talking about this for 24 minutes. And we do have a mock guide that I'll tell you about at the end of the session. Oh, maybe I'll tell you about it now. We do have a mock guide that's called revocable living trust. And I would recommend that you take a look at that if you're thinking about it, even if you already have one, just to review and make sure, yep, we've got everything in there we wanted, and this is what we can do, or this is what we cannot do. Then we have a new flower. Yep, we've got the Richardson geranium. I took this in the Deer Lodge National Forest after a rain. And believe me, I was thrilled to get it in focus because you just can't believe how many flowers have all these little, little bitty things to take uh, that can be blurred. So we've got Richardson geranium, and that reminds me of Granny. Granny Richardson is going to share some information with us. And she is an individual that has five, count them, five grandchildren, and she wants to treat them equally. So what she has done so far is that she's got some mutual funds, she's got some certificates of deposit, and she's taken advantage of what are called the TODs, transfer on death. So you see, she's named a beneficiary from each, for each one of those. And then for the COD, or the certificates of deposit, she has placed a POD. And what is a POD? Well, we learned it's a payable on death designation. So we look at that and, you know, she's wanting to treat her grands equally. And what do you see happening here? Well, of course, we've got to Emily that's going to get $10,000 if she died today. And we've got good old Jim and he's going, oh, yeah, I'm going to get 14. Well, he wouldn't know because granny wouldn't tell him yet. But she's looking at that saying, oh, this is not accomplishing my goal. I've got one grandchild that's going to get almost $4,000 more. And that's not what I want to happen. I don't want them fighting or feeling nasty to one of the other grand, their cousins, you know? You, you want to get together at Thanksgiving and Christmas and have a good time and not have resentment, okay? So her dilemma is what can I do about this uneven distribution? Well, one possibility is this she could do what is called a testamentary trust. Okay, what is a testamentary? This is a trust that is formed when you die. So in your will, like Granny, she says, I want all my assets to go into this testamentary trust. And what she's going to do is make the trust the beneficiary of all of those assets, okay? So let's take a look at what Granny has. Well, we know she has some life insurance. So, you know, she bought it years ago. She still has it. She's got some bank accounts that she could put a POD to the testamentary trust. She's got some stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. She can put those into the testamentary trust. And she's got some property. Okay, she's got some real estate. She can do a transfer on death deed and say that goes into the testamentary trust. So you see this testamentary trust is very similar to the sugar bowl that we had for the revocable one, only it's established when she dies. And who knows, maybe granny had some long ago retirement plan and she's got some leftover or something. So she could put that into the testamentary trust. Now the attorney is going to recommend to her, see her mind was, ah, if I do a testamentary trust, I don't need a will. No, 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 you do. And you say, why? Well, there's the pour over section in a trust, or I mean in the will. And what it says is if I have anything that I forgot to put in the name of the trust, you know, or in the, you know, in the trust when I died, 
you know, maybe she had a certificate of deposit that she forgot about. She doesn't have a POD on it. So granny's $10,000 is going to go into this testamentary trust as well. So the whole idea is we've got this big bowl here that we are putting all of these assets into. And see then in her testamentary trust in plan A is she could leave one fifth to each of the children. So the trustee would be directed, sell all of granny's property, cash in the CDs, we got a pile of money in this sugar bowl and we're gonna give one fifth to each of the, the five grandchildren. Okay, that's plan A. So that's a consideration for granny. Well, they're happy. They get together at Thanksgiving and they have a toast to granny. They're really, really happy. Now, plan B is granny saying, you know, I really want to invest in the education of my grandchildren. So I'm going to direct the trustee that they will use the money in this trust for the education of the grandchildren. But granny's going to be specific. She says books and tuition. If they want to go out for pizza, whatever, on Friday and Saturday nights, she's not going to pay for that. No, they're going to have to work. They're going to have to get some of their own spending money. So granny has that choice. And then she could say upon graduation of the last grand grandchild, then the trust is distributed to all equally, whatever's left over. So you see, if you're thinking about one of these trusts, whether it be revocable living or testamentary, you have a lot of thinking to do of how you want it to operate. Think what if, what if, what if. That's part of the attorney's Mar job. Mm -hmm. Marcia? Sure. One, one person just made a comment and said the wills pour over puts things into the trust, question mark. Yes, you see the, you could, you could say, I don't have any PODs, TODs or anything. You, you're a single person. You have all the property in your name. So in your will, you, you're gonna establish, when I die, I want all of my assets to go into this testamentary trust and you'll come up with a name for it. And then your trustee is going to take all of these items that are solely owned in your name right now, because you waited and did a testamentary trust. They're then going to be titled into the name of the trust. And then the trustee will read the directions about what you said, that you, how you wanted this money to be done. You know, be done. There's a better way to say that, but how you want it to be spent for the beneficiaries. And maybe what's going to happen is you say you just simply, uh, what you're going to do is disperse it. Now, why is this better than a, the will? Well, when you die with your will, your personal representative immediately distributes the property to the individuals. Okay, with the trust, you're saying, no, I don't necessarily want it to go out that way. I want this money to be used for these purposes. So it's your objectives. Remember way back when we talked about estate planning objectives or goals, and we've got those in estate planning the basics. And take a look at those and see if some of those might meet the goals that you have. And so what we're looking at here are tools that can help you accomplish your goals. And some of you have complicated estates and there's going to be different recommend, recommendations for you. Some of you have minor children. So, wow, if you've got minor children, then I think you might think about uh, a, a testamentary trust so that that those funds could be used for the education of the children, for the housing of the children, you decide. And we're going to look at that a little bit closer later. So um, the benefits to granny of thinking about this approach, and I guess I should say I'm not promoting any specific thing. What I'm trying to do as an educator 
is to have you think of the consequences, think of things and help you sort all this out in the mind so that when you go in to an attorney that you can say, this is what we wanna have accomplished. That is the true purpose of estate planning is to make things the way you want them. And it's your plan, you're paying for it. You know, you have a right to have your expectations in that way met. And there's legal ways to do it instead of just depending on talking to Uncle Charlie and then saying, well, Uncle Charlie, look, I'm gonna give you this money and I want you to use it for X. And you know, Uncle Charlie may do that, but oh geez, what if Uncle Charlie develops a alcoholic problem? What if his creditors come after him and they, you know, come after the money. So we're looking at ways to protect your assets for the benefit of what you want it to be used for. And here's this other one. Um, the beneficiary's creditors do not have any right to the assets in that testamentary trust because it's, it's not the kids. It's the testamentary trust for the kids. So that could be an advantage specifically for some of your grandchildren. So testamentary trust could be a useful tool and you can do that for treating those grandchildren equally or equitably the way you want. Now I've had a contest every time and I really tried to got, come up with something that related to what we were doing and you know, brain wasn't working. So this is your contest for this session. I have a beautiful flower here and I want you to name that flower if you know what it is and you put the name in the chat room and if four or five of you uh guess the correct name what we'll do is i'll put them in a hat and i'll draw out a name and that's the person that will get uh five of our five of our cards uh, okay so name that flower isn't it pretty Oh, wow. Fun to look at flowers and see what they look like. Okay, put that in your mind, put it in the chat box and don't look it up on the internet. That's cheating. You gotta, you know, not do that. All right, explores gentian. What we're going to do is explore some other uses for a testamentary trust. And I've kind of mentioned the minor children because the idea is to manage the assets until they reach a certain age and you determine that. You see, you die with a will and your assets go out to your minor child. At age 18, that child says, hi. Well, we have to fir first appoint a conservator. Then at age 18, the kid gets the money. Now, I don't know about you guys. I thought I was so mature at age 18. Well, give me a break. I only thought I was. So it's something to think about there. Can you trust an 18 year old with $100,000 with $500,000, whatever? And maybe you've got what, and, and this is an incompetent heir. You know, there's words in the leg, legislative Montana codes annotated, and they call an individual incapacitated or incompetent. But that means they can't manage money. And we probably all know somebody that's like that. We may have some addiction challenges with that, or heaven forbid, we have some <laughs> granny told me my kid, my grandchild joined a cult. And I do not wish to leave that money to that grandchild because it'll go to the cult. Okay. So we may also have that in incapacitated spouse, maybe a stroke, uh, Maybe it's Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. We're seeing lots of those kinds of things being diagnosed now. What about uh, a brain injury from a car accident? I know people these things have happened to. And if, you know, what's gonna happen to that spouse, you die. You know, you're out here on the interstate and boom, uh, there's a serious car accident and, and you die. Well, who, how are we gonna help that spouse that's incapacitated? So you could have a testamentary trust where everything goes in to provide for that individual. And here's an example where it, uh, where it did happen. A little bit different family situation here, but you know, take a look. We've got a situation here, dad has Alzheimer's. 
mom passed away in 2010. So I'm going to ask you, what fraction, if any, does the surviving uh, son there, what is he going to receive? Okay, so you're going to tell me, say nothing, one third, one sixth, one seventh. Don't forget to hit the submit button. Mom dies. What does the son receive? In Montana, again, so you 19 out of state are sorry, this is Montana. Okay, uh, Carrie, let's see what we got here. Okay, 15% of you are saying nothing. We've got one third with 17%, 6% goes with the one sixth, and we only had 2% that said one seventh. Well, this is a doozy of a one because what happens here is we find that mom dies, of course, and everything is going to go to dad. He's got Alzheimer's. He's not going to be able to manage that. And you see, she could have left everything into a testamentary trust and named her son as the trustee, but she didn't. So we have to have a procedure in district court and we're going to name guardianship of dad and conservatorship. You know, the whole idea was dad would probably die first, but mom was a caregiver. And unfortunately, we're seeing that 18% of caregivers pass away before the person that they're taking care of. So that's really sad and it could happen. So let's just be adult about it and say, okay, if that happens, what can I do? And we've got a mom guide to help with that as well. But mom could do the uh, testamentary trust she could then name her son as the trustee. And that's what we're going to do to make sure that we can provide for dad. So it's possible. So my fabulous Friday trip from the uh, Explorers Gentian is it could help you avoid a court procedure with guardianship and conservatorship. Cause that's not something we wanna have dad have to go to court and you know, I'll, it happens, but we could avoid it. Now, this happens to be a wood lily, and why would I use a wood lily? Well, we would explore different standards for our trust. And one thing we could say, we're gonna leave it up to the trustee judgment. We're gonna say health, education, maintenance, and support. Yay, okay, okay. So here is Chris. Chris would like to take a trip to Europe in the summer. And, and you're the trustee, all of you out there are the trustee, and Chris says it would be a very educational experience. Okay, you are the trustee. Would you provide funds from the trust so that Christopher can go to Europe because it's educational? And remember, you've been told health, education, maintenance, and support. So quickly tell me, are you gonna do it or not? You're the trustee. Are you going to allow or give money to Christopher so he would be able to go to Europe? I'm not gonna give you much time on this one because I'm keeping track of time and I'm seeing I'm, I've been ranting and waiting and I'm running behind. So what do we got there? Okay, we've got seven of you that uh, say yes and we've got 25% or 12 that said no. You know, and this is what happens. It's your opinion on how you would do it if you were one of those individuals in charge. And we can see there's not an agreement on that. So you could do mandatory. You could also say this, these assets would be handed out at a predetermined age. And maybe the beneficiary would receive it on age 25, 35, or 40. It could be intervals, so they get part of it now, part of it in the future. Really, with this trust, you can do what it is you want to. So I'm curious, real quick, what do you think would be the best age to distribute assets in a trust to a beneficiary? What age would you think is best? 
20 to 25, 26 to 30. Or over 61 years, what do you think? Okay, Carrie, what do we got here? Okay, we have the majority saying 26 to 30 years. Uh, that's good. We've got some even older. Uh, it's uh, really funny here. I had one lady at one of my meetings pre-COVID, and she came up to me and said, well, guess when I get mine? I said, I have no idea. 65. So there's some uh, parents that really wanted to make sure that she made her own living and actually they were going to help out at retirement time. Isn't that interesting? So we also could explore, or maybe you would explore a life occurrence. You know, you could say, well, when they graduate, when they get married, when they have a child, you make those, all those decisions. And one of the things your attorney will tell you is less you would make use of percentages of fractions because we do see you know assets um do change in value and you don't want to have a situation where you said you know a hundred thousand here hundred thousand there and when you die all you've got is fifty thousand for example and those um percentages can change in this case 55 percent to the 4-h foundation and i'm getting my bid in there for uh msu extension of course uh, but they get less only 45 percent of the estate how much does it cost for that corporate trustee you know i told you it does vary uh we looked at that and then the cost would just be dependent upon and one of the things i found though is uh a lot of the trustee or corporate trustees do not want to manage a business. Okay, so you die. And sometimes if you don't have enough assets, they're going to say no. And there you are. You don't have $300,000. And that's where you may, may end up having a relative do it because there's not somebody that you just have too little of money to do that with. So a testamentary trust would be used to protect those assets. Uh, for those children, a financially incompetent heir, those living with uh, dementia, though, those are potential uses out there. And, you know, we had the Bitterroot family that we talked about before, and certainly we learned, we know, we found out that what happened is dad remarried. And we found, well, she got all the property. And then we found when she died, it was going to be divided among her children. Okay, and that wasn't what we wanted to have happen. So what those parents could do is sever the joint tenancy. And what they can then do is have a tenancy in common where each one owns one half. And then they could have a, a living trust or a life estate to take care of that. So here we have a husband and he's saying he wants um, the home to go to the wife for life. And then upon her death, it's going to go to the beneficiaries. So we would be able to handle that. And I do have attorneys that say, oh, don't even talk about life estates. You know, they're not what we want to recommend for people anymore. We want trust because we can put all the rules and regulations in there. And often what ha happens with the life estate is the will says, I leave my wife a life estate, period. Then you don't know who's paying this, what's going on with that, and we include all that stuff in a trust. So that's something to think about. Also, what the uh, parents could do is title the property in their name only. Okay, so we got two separate pieces here. And then they could have a testamentary trust for each of those. And what happens then is it goes to the children. So she, the kids can inherit from dad. Uh, her kids could inherit from her. There's Q-tip trusts. Okay, and we've got a mock guide that goes into that, but it's just with the Q-tip, you are predetermining what happens. You also qualify some for the uh, marital or the deduction with the estate tax, but we're not gonna get into that since 99.9% .9 of us don't have it. But it's again, husband leaves certain things to the kids, the wife has stuff in the trust, and then upon her death, the what's left of the trust goes down to the kids. You know, it's uh, very handy. So the bitter root tells us that we can use these trusts 
and achieve some of our estate planning goals. And then we've got the golden prickly pear. Well, what's that? Quickly, most people tell me they know someone who has, or a friend, who has a child that is special needs. Well, if that special needs child inherits more than $2,000, they can't get some of the, you know, like live in a group home, get training for a job and things like that. And so you have a golden opportunity with a self-sufficiency trust. These are special trusts that leaves property into the trust. The child has no control over it. And it's, you have a trustee then that provides the extra things for the child. So if you have someone like that, they need to know that there is a handbook out there uh, for trustees. It was redone in 1920. And it has information about administering a special needs trust. So share that with them. The special alliance uh, or the special needs alliance has great information. So don't miss out on this golden opportunity to help out a special needs grandchild, uh, other kind of relative. Well, oops, from the lady slipper times has slipped away. I hope I steered you to become aware of the uses of revocable living trusts. I hope I steered you to become aware of the uses of the testamentary trust. And if you don't have a memory like this elephant's head, we've got 48, yes, 40, eight not guys 40 48 okay got it we've got the revocable living trust one we've got one a colleague has done here using trust in a state plan for children from blended marry or blended families okay it's a more recent one that's been updated and then uh i finished one on testamentary trust because of all the questions and i've actually had time since i'm not traveling so much to get one written and it's at our publications office. So if you want to receive notification or just have me attach it to a file to you, put that request in the chat room. Or if you want to send me an email later, that's fine as well, because I've established a place that I can put all those emails in and get it to you, the testamentary trust. And don't forget, you can also go to our website, download those, just look up Estate Planning Montana, and you'll get that. And they're also available at our extension offices. Type those questions in the chat panel, and I'm gonna remain on after we have our guests and respond to those questions. Next week, what are we gonna talk about? Financial powers of attorney and healthcare power of attorney. Those are two separate documents, and that's what we'll do. Now let's give some time here to our special guest, Emma. And Emma is Agricultural and Natural Resources Specialist with the 4-H Center. And I'm going to quit sharing so that we can take a look at Emma and find out what exactly it is that you do with the uh, 4-H program, Emma. Tell me about it. Yeah. Hi, Marcia. Thanks for having me on today. Um, so as the Ag and Natural Resources Specialist, I oversee the 4-H projects that are within those disciplines. Um, so the biggest projects are um, maybe not surprisingly livestock and the horse projects, um, but that also covers all of the plant and crop sciences. And my background is in uh, plant sciences. So that's one of the things that has been one of my main goals uh, since I started in May is trying to build crop science and ag science projects. So we just are getting the supplies in for some ag science kits. So uh, those were sponsored by 406 Agronomy through Torgerson's. Um, so those are available for free for any Montana 4-H member and it includes supplies so they can independently create a um, crop science based project. Um, we're also, as of yesterday actually, so this is even since I talked to you, Marsha, um, we're working with Montana Wheat and Barley to put small grains in the curriculum as part of the Great Falls School District. Um, and then we're also working to develop a quiz bowl um, for more of the high school range students. So we have a lot of really exciting projects um, to kind of encourage plant sciences. Um, we're not quite as flashy as, you know, 
beef and swine and horse. So uh, I'm really excited about that. Well, that does sound exciting. And to get the support of these uh, folks out there that do this kind of, you know, that the wheat and barley commission, and there's others that are there. And boy, you're newer than I thought, you know, May, you really got a <laughs> lot going already. That's great. Yeah. Tell me, did you have a background in 4-H at all? I did not, no. Um, I I grew up with horses and I grew up going to county fairs, but I was not part of a community that had an active 4-H club. So this has all been new to me, um, but it's just been so wonderful learning about the organization and all of the opportunities that it creates for um, youth across the nation. And I think one of the things that I found that's been really special is how much 4-H operates as a legacy organization that I'm meeting people here who are, you know, like fourth generation 4-H. And I, I didn't know when I had taken this job, um, my grandpa is 96 and he did 4-H in Connecticut. He did a turkey project. So, I mean, it's really, it's interesting to see how 4-H has persisted throughout generations and how it's really adapted, um, but still maintained a lot of its really important core values throughout, you know, multi-generational spans. Yeah, and well, I've heard that there's 200 projects that you could take in 4-H. And uh, is your goal to kind of have a, a new project with this kit that you're sending out with uh, to people? Yeah, so uh, we're building that into a few new projects. So as if, you know, 200 wasn't enough, we wanted to add a few more. Um, yeah. And just really tailor it to Montana because ag is such a big part of the economy. Um, we're hoping to add a project that's based on pulse crops. Um, so the chickpeas, lentils, dry beans. And then also the Sugar Beet Cooperative in Montana has reached out to me and is interested in um, starting a program for youth, which I think is really cool because it's not necessarily one of the crops you immediately think of when you think of Montana. So um, we're really just trying to create opportunities for kids. So whatever they're learning in 4-H, they could take as a valuable life skill to then contribute back into the Montana economy. Yeah, well, this sounds like a tough one. Uh, if I'm a townie kid, um, could I participate in this as well? Because it's not something I, it sounds interesting, but mm, do I have to be a 4 ager to do it? So uh, you, you would have to join 4-H, but we're trying to increase accessibility for, especially as, you know, areas like Bozeman are really becoming more urban. Um, so, you know, the university has these research stations and off-site testing locations for the breeding program throughout the state. Sure. Um, so what the hope is, is maybe we can start to utilize those centers. So even students who don't personally come from a family with land, um, they can have the opportunity to experience agriculture on more of a commercial scale. And I guess I'll make a plug too, because uh, for my family on my mom's side is from Iowa. Um, as you're looking and this, this would be a whole nother can of worms for estate planning. But if your family has land and you're interested in supporting youth agriculture and even through the university, um, you know, reach out and talk about how you could maybe work on getting that into some sort of, uh, you know, with the university that we could use it for youth development programs. Or if you want to host a local kid, uh, give them just like an acre. Um, that would be fantastic because it's so hard yeah. if you don't have land. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, if you don't have land, it's so hard for those kids to get those opportunities. And so everyone is really, really appreciative um, if you have those resources to share. Well, that sounds really like, yes, a legacy. And maybe I don't give the whole farm to the 4-H Foundation, but I might consider, ah, I'll still let my kids over here, but I would dig the, designate this uh, to be maybe for the purpose that you're talking about. 
And yeah. what about some of these big gardens? Are there any ways that yes you could incorporate there? Yes. Yeah. Oh, any any and all space is so valuable, especially um, again, we have a lot of participants who even if they live in rural areas, you know, they're living in small quarters, they're living in uh, either multi-generational housing or multi-family housing. And to them, you know, even a space in your garden is huge compared to having, you know, a windowsill planter. Um, so it can really make a big difference, just any and all space. Sometimes just getting your hands in the dirt is good in planting and watching something grow. Uh, yeah. I remember as a kid, I'm out with my grandma's on the farm and just took a couple of uh, bean seeds, you know, beans, they weren't even seeds. And then the next time it came out to uh, visit grandma, it had grown to this high. And I was just so excited that, you know, cause I was a town kid and uh, it was kind of neat. What other ideas do you have for these uh, crops? How can you, Get it to the point where it's like showing beef at the county fair. What what could I do with the grains at the county fair? Yeah, yeah. so um, a few a few different ideas we have. One of the big ones is trying to find sponsorships to offer some sort of a prize. Uh, that's definitely one of the appealing aspects we've heard for livestock projects is they're able to sell their project. And they, you know, make this money to then go towards college funds later. Um, so that's that's one of the avenues we're looking at is trying to find sponsorships to say, oh, you know, you did the wheat project, you did this really wonderful investigation of how to grow wheat in your environment. Um, we want to reward that in a way that's comparable to a livestock project. Uh, we're also looking at if it's not a tangential reward trying to increase the experiential rewards for anyone who does those projects. So if you're gonna do a small grains project, um, you know, we're gonna take you on a tour of the cereal quality lab here in Bozeman. Um, and just getting to see some of the different areas of small grain production in Montana and experiencing it or um, there are a lot of scholarships available through the university and other organizations that a lot of high school students just don't know about because uh -huh. ag isn't as big of a component of a lot of the curriculums across the state anymore. So even just promoting, if you do these projects in 4-H, you're really setting yourself up to potentially get a good chunk of your tuition at MSU um, covered because those are pretty small. So that's 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 the plan. Um, we'll see in the next year to five years how that how that goes. Well, golly, a person could even establish a revocable living trust uh, and put some money into it to say this would be used for the some more projects, more kits, or something like that. And then I could see how it was used and think, oh, this is wonderful. And so next year I might put in more, or I could go ahead and give some money to the 4-H foundation, but I could make it uh, specific. So here's my money and I want it to be used for the cereal grains project or something along. Yeah. So there's, you know, the sky's the limit in for folks that really believe in kids and giving them some opportunities. And wow, this I'm just glad you came to Montana with these great ideas. It's so exciting. Yeah. And like, again, she's only been here since May. Yeah. So any parting words for our folks today of uh, what you would like for us to think about besides the legacy, the multi-generational, the opportunity out there to learn. Could I do it as an adult? I'm thinking about me learning more about those kinds of things. Yeah, so, you know, I think if you want to reach out, there are some awesome ag extension agents who do some really, really wonderful outreach programs. And if you just want to learn more about ag production in your region, again, every summer, those experiment stations, so those seven experiment stations across the state do farm tours. Um, and all of the breeders come out and it's, they're really, really great opportunities. Um, and I guess the only other thing I would leave you with 
is um, I'm certainly not the first person to say that there's a bit of a crisis in American agriculture that a lot of new generations aren't showing interest in continuing agricultural legacy of their family um, and people are moving away from the farm. And so it's really important to encourage agricultural science and crop sciences in the elementary through high school students. So, you know, they are aware of these job possibilities and it's not this archaic, you know, that's what grandma and grandpa did. It's a very high tech, very cutting edge, um, very lucrative career choice. And we really want to highlight that, um, especially to the kids who may not see that as a, as a career opportunity. So, so I think what we're doing in schools is really important and uh, yeah, we're so excited for all the support from the state. Okay, and it was great for you to bring in the uh, experiment stations that we have. That's the old term, what's the new term? Anyway, there are the research stations out there. The research stations. Uh, one outside of Bozeman and I've driven them past, you know, on the way to uh, Haver. And I, yeah, I could see a, a tour uh, for individuals that haven't had a chance to see agriculture in production and show this is different from this over here. So, yeah. Emily, we thank you very much for joining us, for sharing the information about uh, what you're doing. And, uh, you know, we can uh, look forward to visiting with you again sometime in the future. Maybe we'll do fabulous Fridays next uh, January through March or February through March. That would be so, great. Well, thank, thank you again for your day. Bye-bye. Okay, well, thank you for holding on there. And I'm going to refer to Carrie and say, Carrie, do we have some questions out there that uh, need some answers that maybe I know or don't know and need to look up? Yes, let me get those for you. So um, the first question, Marcia, is so in a will, I could not state my son Joe gets a thousand when he turns 30. Oh no, you could say that. But the problem would be when he's age 30, uh, what is that thousand dollars worth? And what if there's not a thousand dollars left? So you might choose to say, and your attorney would recommend, well, one fifth of whatever, because if you want, let's say you wanted him to have a thousand and you wanted somebody else to have 5,000, well, there may not be that much in the estate. So what do we do with this? Uh, and you don't really want to put your personal representative in a situation where you have to determine, well, do I give this in the thousand because that's all that's left? Or do I try to do it as a percentage? So that's the point of that. It's not to say you can't do it, but the attorneys have found through time because of the difference in what happens to particularly when you're leaving stock to kids and you're wanting to make it kind of equal well you can't use dollar amounts you need to use that fraction approach uh, to accomplish your goals so think about it and you know you can still do the thousand if you want okay next question are testamentary trusts cheaper to set up than a revocable living trust you know, that is an excellent question. Um, and, and maybe we need to think process here because if you are going to have uh, a revocable living trust, we have the name of the trust. We've already switched the names into the name of the trust. Okay, so that's one thing. Then if we do a testamentary trust, that's the point at which we're gonna change the titles from your name into the name of the trust. So it could be there that, you know, we've got something somewhat equal because what we've got is the cost of changing the titles. And maybe it's not a big deal. Maybe your trustee is going to change the titles for free. But oftentimes what happens is relatives want to um, have the trustee change the titles and they'll do it uh, and pay them a, a percentage or pay them a certain amount of money. So I can't really say that one costs more than the other. It depends on what it is that we're going to be able to do with that trust 
and how long it's going to be in operation, so to speak. And do we have enough there to have a trustee manage? So we can't think just establishing the trust, but we've got to think of the maintenance of the trust as well. And maintenance, you know, most of your corporate trustees are going to have an annual maintenance fee. And then depending on how much time they have to spend on your trust, they will have an additional fee. So you got to take a look uh, at that and ask questions. I found that several institutions have a sh an eight and a half by 11 sheet that's printed up and it gives their fees based on the amount of the estate. And then they do such things as well. If we should happen to do this, this is our, our fee. If we do that, that's our fee. And you'll have some that may choose to run a business because that's what you had as an agreement with them. But I also had several say, uh -uh, we don't, we manage money. We want to put things into money. We know how to do that. We don't know how to run a ranch. We don't know how to do a downtown business. So, you know, and it depends on, are you in billings with stuff? or your, and I don't want to pick on Ecolaca, but it's a little bit smaller and you may have somebody in the bank or some other uh, financial institution that could assist with that. So I don't need to hate those, it depends things, but it does. Okay, next question. Is the trust document submitted to the county, state, or federal record? No, 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 that is the benefit. You know, is the trust document, does it have to be filed? And the answer to that is no, it doesn't. Matter of fact, the reason you wouldn't, a trust, many people want it because of the privacy. They don't want everybody in the county knowing how they treated their children, et cetera. Whereas with a, with a will, you know, sorry, but you have a will, it is submitted for probate. It becomes a matter of public record. And so any Tom, Dick, and Harry can go into the courthouse and say, I want to, you know, sorry, they can do that. Well, I don't think a lot of people do it, but they may. And with this trust, no, you do not have to have that filed at all. So that is where the privacy comes from. Now, you may think everything's totally private, but believe you me, if we have some kid that's been left out, when the kid goes to the coffee shop, there's a lot of uh, haranguing that goes on and boy, you know, blah, blah, blah. So pretty soon the whole town knows anyway. And usually it's small towns where that happens. Here in Bozeman, you know, you go to the coffee shop, who's gonna overhear the conversation? But I've overheard conversations in local places and believe me, I've had to bite my tongue sometimes and not jump in and say, but wait a minute, how do you know the kid was disinherited? Was it, you know, uh, the way the property was titled? Was it because of the will? Was it because of the trust? Sometimes you need more information. And that's what I find when somebody calls me, they try to tell me this, and I need to know six other things before I can respond to just the basic question, because how's the property title? What did the will say? And what did the trust say? And oftentimes nobody has a copy of the trust except the trustee. Well, a really good trustee is going to make sure the rest of the beneficiaries know what that trust says, unless they've been directed not to. That way, all the beneficiaries are on what I would call an equal plane. Everybody knows this is what mom and dad wanted. Same way with the will. You get a copy of it. The personal representative should send all of the interested parties a copy so that everybody knows this is what's going on. Okay, Marcia, this is the last question and it's kind of long. Um, okay. How do I, how do I find out the content of an ancestor's trust written in 1931 with the bank as trustee? The bank successor says they don't keep papers over seven years old. I was not able to find a record of the trust full mineral rights sale. Oh, 
This is coming up more and more because people did not probate or even include mineral rights, you know, and you know what's going on in Sydney and North Dakota. So what they've got to go back to, you know, and I've had this question before is, okay, we're back at 19, whatever it is. Getting a copy of that may be totally impossible. Okay, so let's go and take a look and see if there are any records. Go to the clerk of the district court and let's see uh, in a probate, was a probate held? Were the mineral rights actually included in the probate or not? You know, because it could be they were never included in the trust to begin with. Um, you know, and we've got some companies that are holding royalty checks because they don't know who to send it to because nobody handled the probate and, you know, to take care of this particular situation. So out there, there are individuals that are called land men, and I'm sure they could be land women too. And that's what these people are doing in North Dakota and Eastern, Eastern Montana. They're going clear back to these records to try to sort out who owns what because each generation it's been more divided so it's kind of like tenancy in common and so it may be at this point in time that there's 30 people that have an interest in that property but until we get some sort of documentation huh, that company's not going to send the money out at all and you've got to be able to prove ownership of that so I wish you luck uh, and best wishes in that process, because if you're trying to do it, uh, you're going to be hit with roadblocks all the time. And it may end up, let's get, let's get handed over to someone that does that all the time and be able to help you out. I would also suggest um, looking at the title company records. You would be able to go back and see, you know, was their insurance on the property and how was it divided at the end? Because there would be names on the documents. So good luck. Okay, Carrie, you said that that was the last question and I see we're kind of exceeding our time. So I'll say, I wish you a, a very good weekend and join us next week when we're going to be looking at financial powers of attorney and our healthcare power of attorney, because both of those have forms and one of them is statutory and the other one is sort of what we're calling a model form and we'll be able to share those with you. So until we meet again, if I could sing that, I would. Uh, you have a good week and we'll see you next Friday. Fabulous Friday time. Bye-bye.